Hello everyone, I am the High Priest of the Economicon, the Economancer, and today we're going to be learning the criticisms to the previous video of subjective economic status, more importantly the way we framed it in the general strain theory. We're going to look at some criticisms of this and kind of give some of my thoughts on the issues that are at hand with this. And I hope by the end of this video, you come away with a much greater understanding of these criticisms, as well as an overall understanding of how this affects criminality and society. With that being said, let's start it off. I'm going to give three, what I think reasonable or well, reasonable contradictions to this, you know, issue to, you know, general strain theory. The first one is, biologically determined differences right now i don't think that biological determined differences matter entirely but i think this puts too much emphasis on it the second one is collective efficacy this is also in the same general framework this structuralist approach to criminal criminology and the third is victim mentality um, and victim mentality also goes hand in hand with the criminal mind or criminal mentality. So let's start off with the biologically determined. So first, Agnew's um, general strain theory does a pretty good idea on understanding, you know, low income crime. But what it doesn't do is have a very good explanation for white collar criminality. Now, uh, this is not a new criticism and there's been a lot of, you know, back and forth on this. And a lot of it points to, well, you know, there's still this, issue of inequality of status and party associated with an individual in a white collar environment you know we go back to that original uh, example i gave about the you know that the kid that lives in the rich neighborhood but doesn't actually feel uh very good about it because you know he's not as rich as the others around him so he feels you know different in that hierarchy and he doesn't have the lower hierarchy that he can go to so he's kind of like isolated right now Here's the issue with that. First and foremost, even if I give you that, even if I assume that to be true, you would assume that this individual, as they would move up in life through their own hierarchy, by their own choices, they would, you know, come to some point where they equilibrate with where they're supposed to be with where they are. And yet that doesn't happen. Now, I don't know what systemic reasons could cause this to happen, but it doesn't seem like those would be, you know, validating the reason why they're committing white collar crime so that seems to be a serious issue and that is something that goes into this next part about you know the biologically determined differences so first and foremost we know that personality is for the most part biologically determined now there are cultural factors that can influence this but for the most part we know that it's biologically determined um, so, and you can take your political preferences and map them to your personality. So your political preferences are roughly biologically determined, but they're also choices that we make as individuals. So it's hard for me to not compare those two, that I make a choice to be whatever my political affiliation is, or I make a choice to be a criminal. And I think that this seems to be a pretty salient, salient idea that's not being addressed by the general strain theory that needs to be involved. And if it's not, then we're missing an entire link because we also have this idea that there's a reduction in crime through sexual selection. This is something I talked about, you know, the better, the better angels of our nation by better angels of our nature by Steven Pinker. Now he had talked about how uh, the inclusivity, uh, and, you know, diversity arguments have led to increasing our cultural diversity, which has led to increasing our femininity in our normal social systems. And this increase in femininity in our normal social structure has uh, decreased the amount of violence. Now, we can also say that because of these social changes, this has also changed the selection mechanism for women and men. And so women are less likely to, uh, you know, sexually select a partner that is higher in criminality. And thus, this biologically is reduced. Then we have the Stephen Levitt argument about uh, abortions and that this reduction in children 
that would be raised in environments that were negative and such, um, as well as, you know, they're also reducing the population of criminals by reducing the population of individuals who are going to be more biologically determined to uh, commit criminal behavior. Now, what I want to point out is that this has some ethical issues in the argumentation that, yes, it does seem like it's it's manifesting itself in, uh, you know, pro eugenics argument. But I, that's not the argument that I'm not, that I'm trying to make. I'm just trying to say until we can add in, you know, this biologically determined differences, then we're not going to be able to actually look into, you know, general strain theory more broadly. We're just going to be looking at these social factors. And then the last one is that antisocial personality disorders, uh, whether that's male or female, make up a broad amount of individuals who commit crimes. And antisocial personality disorders are as much biologically determined as they are uh, socially uh, determined. So, yes, they are a social construction by, by nature. But they're also biologically determined in levels of disposition. So again, this is a major argument. This biological determinism is a major argument against general strain theory. The second one, collective efficacy. Um, so this is also a part of the structuralist argument. Now, what it is, it's used to explain why some neighborhoods you know, have more crime. And so essentially, we have a neighborhood, and then we have social intervention in that neighborhood. So there's going to be a reduction in crime through social intervention, and a lot of this is a function of mentorship. This is also a, a grand argument for why, you know, you know, the attack on masculinity isn't necessarily a good thing, because male mentorship uh, significantly declines uh, criminal behavior. Because that's part of this collective efficacy that individuals need uh, for social intervention to limit the amount of crime that happens in their society and their, and their overall feeling. So when we think about this as a general rule, we have to think about what constitutes you know, good collective efficacy. And that is essential uh, to understanding how we can create societies and neighborhoods and cultural institutions that reduce, you know, overall criminality. And that is unity and trust. So to bring together a neighborhood to have high levels of unity and high levels of trust, you're going to automatically reduce, you know, crime. Now to think about this, most crime is done within an area. So if you live in a neighborhood, most of the crime that you're going to be doing is within that area you're less likely to remove yourself from that area to go uh, do your criminal activity um, which is not to say that that will always happen but you know if we can increase this collective efficacy then we'll decrease the amount of crime within that area and so forth so on and so forth now there will be spillover effects or spatial you know geospatial spillover effects where you're going to move to another area so on and so forth but if we continuously knocking down you know, all of these areas and, and increasing this collective efficacy, then obviously we're going to have a very large decrease in crime because there's nowhere for crime to go and there's nowhere for crime to be fostered in. Now, the third, and I think the most important, um, is victim mentality or criminal mind. Now, first we're going to like give a brief idea of what I mean by this. Um, I don't think there is any cognitive or behavioral differences between street crime and white collar crime. I think the, the overall idea that an individual is going through in their head is roughly the same, that they know they're committing a criminal activity. And when push comes to shove, they will, they will, you know, be like, well, I was a victim of circumstances, so on and so forth. And I think that general strain theory really does validate a lot of their beliefs. And I think that's a scapegoat, and I don't think it's very useful. But when we think about this, we're going to have to go into type one and type two thinking, as well as, you know, intuition thinking. What I mean by that is, and if you ever read Kahneman and Tversky um, or Jonathan Haidt, they both have similar conclusions about, you know, the cognitive thought process. 
uh, Tversky and Kahneman have type one and type two. Type one is, you know, uh, those are the heuristics that we use, the biases that we use that help us interact with society without having to have a high cognitive load. So they're automatic almost. And then type two is times that we sit down and think about the actions, the consequences, and so on and so forth. And the intuition model used by Jonathan Haidt is something like um, he puts it as the the intuition is the elephant, and then you have the rider is the person trying to make the decision. So the the <laughs> the elephant is just going to go over wherever it wants because the person riding it. You know, you're going to have to beat that elephant really, really hard to get it to move anywhere. And so you're going to be, you know, under the force of your intuition more so than you are under the force of your own actual cognitive capacity. And so essentially what both of these put together is that like the criminal mind, the criminal intent behind what's going on is already nested inside of you. So your automatic action is to act out in this negative way. And so if we, if we think about that, this goes back to that antisocial personality traits and stuff like that. That's your natural. You, after the fact, will have what's called post hoc um, justifications or post hoc rationalizations to why this happened. You'd be like, well, I was a victim. And so if we remove the post hoc justification uh, argument from general strain theory and say, no, that's not the reason why you were already possessed in doing this, whether it was ideological possession or whether it was monetary possession, any of these things were already built into you or into your cognitive processes prior to the thing happening. So we've removed that and we're going to hear less of that. So as long as we validate it, it's going to happen more in almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Another thing to think about is, you know, um, when it comes to this victim mentality is causative pressures of peer groups, right? We hear a lot of that. Yeah. You know, I'm a victim of my circumstance in my neighborhood. This is the only people that I had to hang out with. That's not true. You go to any of these areas with high crime rates, there's plenty of people that don't do these crimes. There's plenty of ple people that want to remove themselves from crime. And they actually isolate themselves from the criminals. Why didn't you? That's a choice. You made that choice. Now, it may be a choice under, I guess, exigent circumstances. I don't necessarily seem to buy that argument, but it is a choice. You chose to do this. Why you chose to do that? Well, you know, that's up in the air. There may be motivating factors, but I think at the end of the day, most of the motivating factors that you're going to point out are going to be also post hoc justifications for your bad behavior. And so this is something as society we have to think. Stop blaming, uh, stop blaming peer groups because it's just the collection of all the people that want to make the choice to do these bad things. It's not that, you know, someone's older or younger. These individuals are choosing to act this way. And society has to recognize that this is a choice that people are making. Last is kind of this idea that we're, we're looking for an easy, easy way to answer the question on what causes crime. And anytime you look for something as an easy answer, all you're doing in your brilliant mind trying to, you know, brighten this idea, to have this bright idea, this bright light that shines a spot on, you know, this negative aspect. And look, it's so simple. It's just this. We can fix it real easy. I think that's a problem. Because nothing in life is simple, everything is complex, everything is hard. And by looking at this, you know, very simplistic model, all the real or underlying issues that are involved, this, this complexity, whether it's, you know, the biological determinism, the collective efficacy, this victim mentality, all of this gets, you know, just left in the dust because criminal behavior, criminal intent at the end of the day isn't a collective issue it's an individual issue there may be collective issues that are being that are not being taken into account on some issue on uh, some criminals but at the end of the day it's an individual issue it's an individual choice and we have to treat this that way once we move into you know collectivizing crime and stuff like that we're really getting away from the central tenet of you know criminal justice because that matters here when we're looking at this and really i guess the last and 
not an exact criticism, but an overall criticism of many aspects of criminological theory, economic theory, and stuff like that. The question should not be what, what causes criminality. The question should be, <laughs> let, me, let me try to think of this. The question should be, why aren't we all criminals? And then build on that rather than what causes criminality. Why aren't we all criminals? What causes growth or what doesn't cause economic growth? Why is there economic growth? Why do countries grow? Asking the right questions matters here. Everyone has the incentive to be a criminal. Everyone in their own right probably is a criminal. But why isn't it that it's this large issue that society has to deal with to the extent that we don't have unity, that we don't have trust? So I think we're asking the wrong question here and what causes criminal behavior, what causes criminality? The, the real question is, is, why aren't we all criminals? So let me take a step back, let's do a brief overview of everything to make sure everyone's got a good idea. The three arguments against, you know, Agnew's general strain theory is that a big portion of this is biologically determined. You know, collective efficacy matters in this regard. It's from the same school roughly the structuralist approach to criminology and it has better understanding of the issues at hand when it comes to you know collective criminal behavior and how that affects the individual and the last is victim mentality and how we kind of give post hoc justifications for criminals through this general strength theory and how that doesn't help us as a society actually label down and figure out what is criminality and then Last, we're asking the wrong questions. Now, I am more than willing to be proved wrong on any one of these cases, and I hope that you bring them. Uh, I think all of these are very strong criticisms of general strain theory. I think many of them are brought by clinicians, you know, such as uh, Dr. Same Now. Uh, he was a clinical psychologist who wrote a lot on criminal behavior. Uh, he's very influential on me. I would go see his blog. It's samenow.com. Uh, as well as, you know, there's a few others. Stephen Levitt, uh, Freakonomics is a great book, especially for people introducing themselves into economics, as well as, you know, trying to get an understanding of uh, behavioral economics, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman and Tversky. Um, you know, I've already said Stephen Pinker <laughs> a few times. All of these are some really, really good thinkers into this area. Um, I would also implore you to read some, you know, Thomas Sowell. Anyway, please like, share, subscribe, comment. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm right. Tell me how you feel. Let me know if there's anything else you want me to go over, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye.